This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey, welcome to 12tone. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, odds are you found us through our song analysis videos. We've been doing them for years, and in that time, I've gotten a lot better at making them. That's kind of how practice works. But this creates a bit of an unfortunate situation, because I looked at some pretty awesome songs early on in the project, and it's always bugged me that I couldn't really do anything about the flaws in those first few videos. And then I realized I could. I mean, hey, it's my channel. I can do whatever I want. Last year, I started a new series going through those old analyses, correcting mistakes and adding details details that I may have missed the first time through, and today I thought I'd continue that with a few more. Last time we made it up to my Somewhere video, and the next song on the list is Black Hole Sun. This video is special to me because it marks the beginning of my meteoric rise to my current status as a C-list professional YouTuber and internet micro-celebrity. Hey, it's a living. So what did I get wrong here? Well, for starters, I made some probably false claims about the tuning. I said the song was tuned a quarter tone sharp, which means you won't find any of the notes they're playing on a standard piano, and that's true, but I also said it gave the song an unnerving feel, and in retrospect, that's a little questionable. For most people, the main way we perceive music is what's called relative pitch, which means that what matters isn't the notes themselves, it's the intervals between those notes that you're actually picking up on. Some people have what's called perfect pitch, which basically means they can identify the note by its frequency, but if you don't have that, then it shouldn't really matter how it's tuned as long as the intervals are the same, right? Well, yeah, probably. I mean, there's some mitigating factors here. Like, many people who don't have perfect pitch do still have a sort of pitch memory, which is a product of something called the Levitin effect, which I already made a video about link in the description, but basically, even if you don't know you know the exact notes, you may still have them stored in your head somewhere, allowing you to sing familiar songs in the correct key even without a reference frame. I've seen it argued that this may extend to recognizing and being more comfortable in certain tunings, although I'm unaware of any studies confirming that. You also might have a reference frame. After all, people often listen to multiple songs in a row, so if the one you heard before it is in standard tuning, you may notice a change, and as it turns out, head down, the song that comes right before Black Hole Sun on Super Unknown doesn't use quarter tone tuning, at least not that I can tell. But these are both fairly minor effects, and your ears will probably adjust to the new pitches relatively quickly. In fact, being a quarter tone sharp isn't even that rare. There's a popular production trick where you record the song a little bit slow, then speed it up, increasing all the frequencies, which makes it feel brighter and more energetic than if you just played it that fast in the first place. Speeding it up by the ratio of a quarter tone seems to be the sweet spot. It's enough to get the added energy without being so much that it doesn't sound natural. I don't know if Black Hole Sun specifically did did this, but a lot of songs I've looked at over the years have. My background is more in performance than production, though, so at the time I mostly associated quarter-tone tuning with metal bands like Pantera. It was a thing I'd mostly encountered in the context of dark, unnerving music, and when I saw it again in another unnerving song, I think I overestimated the connection between the two. Whoops. On that note, though, one thing that I think actually contributes to the song's unnerving sound is the use of half bars. We're in 4-4, but lots of sections end with an extra bar of 2-4, dragging it all out a little longer than you'd expect and making it hard to trust your sense of timing. I didn't mention it at all in the original video, but I probably should have. With that out of the way, the next thing I want to talk about is a transcription error. At the end of the verse progression, Kim Thale plays this... <laughs> And I want to look at this chord here. In my original video, I called it A-flat diminished 7. Diminished 7ths are highly unstable sounds that can resolve basically anywhere, and one thing they like to do is called a common tone resolution, where you play a diminished 7th and then resolve it to a stable chord, usually major, built on the same root. Considering we're going to A-flat major, then A-flat diminished 7 seems like a perfectly reasonable analysis with one problem. Thale isn't playing an A-flat. But I had a solution. Thale isn't the only one playing notes here. Chris Cornell is singing the melody, and he drops a big fat A-flat over this chord on the first syllable of Disgrace, writing the root and completing our harmony. Except, uh, no, he doesn't. He sings an A there. A, A natural, the note a half step above A-flat, which is unambiguously not the root of an A-flat diminished 7 chord. This is B half diminished. I actually caught that mistake while editing the video, but it was too late to change the drawing, so I just put a disclaimer on the side instead. So what's the correct analysis then? Well, surprisingly enough, I was still basically right. After all, three of the notes are still the same, and those notes still resolve well to the top part of A-flat major. The only difference is that instead of an A-flat holding still, we get an A-natural sliding down a half step for even more resolution. So slightly different chord, but same basic function. And let's talk about that A-flat major. In the video, I called it a Neapolitan chord, which is a fancy word for a major triad built on the flat 2, and since we're in G minor, that's what it is. Except it's kinda not. The Neapolitan chord 
chord is an artifact from a specific musical tradition and it has certain expected behaviors. Like it's almost always played in first inversion, which means that instead of the root, the bass plays the third of the chord, which is the fourth of the key. This means that, in a sense, it may be better to view the Neapolitan as a variation of four minor, serving as a fancy way to set up the five chord. But here we go straight from A flat back to G minor, the one chord, not very Neapolitan. No, on reflection, I'd say this more closely resembles a tritone substitution, which is when you have a dominant seventh chord that resolves down a half step. Now, this isn't quite a dominant seventh either, because no one's playing G flat, but it's reminiscent of it, and the root movement results in a fairly satisfying resolution anyway, so the A flat isn't really setting up the five chord here, it's replacing it. And the last thing I want to look at is in the chorus where we hear this. And I described the last chord as the guitar playing a B flat major triad while the bass played E flat, but I looked up an isolated bass track and I have no idea what I was talking about. I don't know where I got that. It seems too specific to have been a simple transcription error, so maybe I misread a chart somewhere and forgot to double check it, but the bass is definitely playing B flat here. This is just the flat three chord, which in minor can serve as sort of a departure point from that minor tonality, adding some brightness while Cornell sings about washing away the rain. Surprisingly, I couldn't find anyone in the comments of the original video calling me on this, but still, I was wrong. I think that's all I've got for Black Hole Sun, so let's move on to Other Side. This one I'm a little more okay with, but there's still a few things I need to address. First off, another transcription error. The verse has a little tag at the end, and in the video I described that as G to A minor, which makes a lot of sense. The song up to this point has been in the key of A minor, and flat 7 to 1 is a pretty common minor resolution. Only problem is, John Frusciante actually plays A major here. It's subtle, the C sharp is kinda buried in the middle of the voicing, and what with a C natural in the melody over the previous chord, it's easy Easy to miss, but this is definitely major. So why? Well, the lyrics are a bit obtuse, but Anthony Kiedis has described the song as being about his struggles with addiction, and even if you don't interpret it exactly like that, it definitely seems to be about escaping from a bad place into a better one. It focuses a lot on that bad place, but ending each verse with a visit to the parallel major gives us a glimpse of the light at the end of the tunnel, a way through to the other side. It's a small touch, but a powerful one, and I'm sorry I missed it. The next thing I want to talk about is the way they build choruses. This song features four separate choruses, which is kind of a lot in a relatively short song, but each one feels new because they keep adding layers. The first chorus comes right at the beginning with just guitar and bass while the second chorus adds drums, but what I'm really interested in is the third chorus. Here we get background vocals, but they don't just harmonize the melody. Instead, Frusciante takes the first couple syllables of each line and sings them slower, dragging out phrases like how long and I don't to emphasize the message. I hear this as like a growing conviction, with Kiedis' narrator becoming more convinced that he needs to make a change in his life, which comes to a head in the final chorus where we get even more of those elongated phrases is tucked into basically every available space in the arrangement. It's a bit chaotic, but in a way that seems to fit its conclusion. And lastly, I want to take a second to acknowledge the solo, because it's my favorite kind. I love it when artists are bold enough to play an entire solo that's basically just one note. It really emphasizes the different relationships that note has to its supporting harmony, and it sounds great. I don't have any real point to make about it. I guess you could view it as a statement about the repetitive emptiness of addiction, where you keep getting stuck in the same place over and over again. Sure, that sounds like a good enough explanation, but really, I just think it sounds cool and more songs should do it. That's it for Other Side, but hey, we're having fun, let's do one more. The next song on my list is What I've Done, and here there's no transcription errors, no incorrect analyses, no, my issue here is more structural. You see, this video was made as a tribute to the late Chester Bennington, but I'd never actually analyzed a song with so few chords before. It's mostly just one simple loop the whole time, and while I think I did a pretty good job with a harmony, I didn't have the tools to explain why the rest of it worked. I made some vague allusions to textures and dynamics, but it was really missing in detail. For for example, one thing the song plays around with a lot is the juxtaposition of acoustic and electric sounds. We see the acoustic side mostly in the piano, which makes regular appearances in the intro and verses, but gets buried by electric guitars and Linkin Park's signature turntable sounds in the choruses. It's especially prominent in the very beginning, where a big electric guitar swell is suddenly cut off by a solo piano riff. There's a bunch of other little touches like that, like the extra little passing chords that get added to the ends of some of the bars in the chorus, but I don't want to, like, completely remake the video right now or anything. The one part that really bugs me is that... Okay, so this video was supposed to be a tribute to Bennington, but the only time I actually talked about the vocal line was the outro, which was sung by their other vocalist, Mike Shinoda. From an arranging standpoint, though, this song couldn't have worked without Chester. His part was the glue that held it together. How? Well, the song works by alternating between quiet and loud sections, but those sorts of sudden dynamic shifts can be really jarring, so Bennington's voice helps smooth out the transitions. Probably the best place to see this is going into the first chorus. The band is still playing with that softer verse dynamic, the piano is still pretty prominent, but then he jumps up to belt out 
a powerful what I've done, the guitar responds with some chugs and the whole band comes crashing in at the chorus dynamic. It feels really natural, but it only works because Bennington is steering the ship, telling us where we're going before we actually go there. Compare this to the intro, where we hear basically the same transition, but with just the instruments, and it feels way more drastic. At the end of the chorus, he reverses that, holding one last powerful note while the band drops into the softer verse dynamic again, letting the energy slowly fade off instead of getting abruptly cut. It's great arranging, making perfect use of an incredible singer, and I wish I'd been able to cover it back then instead of three years later. Still, better late than never. I think that's it for now. The next song on my list is comfortably numb, but we're starting to go long, so I'm gonna save that for next time. Thanks for watching, and please do let me know if you want me to keep making these correction videos. This series is all about self-improvement. I want to become a better music theorist, which means learning from my past mistakes. But right now, self-improvement can be hard, so if you're looking to build new skills under quarantine, there's a great course on how to set up and record in a home studio over on Skillshare. It's taught by Grammy-winning producer Young Guru, and it covers all sorts of important things like how to set up your room, what equipment to use, and how best to control your frequencies. Plus, once you've got a good setup, he has courses on mixing, mastering, and other production skills too. Just because the world shut down doesn't mean you have to stop making music. And once you're a member, you'll also have access to the rest of their library of courses, including skills like cooking, writing, and productivity that are more important now than ever. Plus, if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description, Skillshare's even offering two free months of premium membership, and we're all gonna need something to do for the next few months anyway. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patrons, Duck and Howard Levine. If if you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.